the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. So let's go, let's go back. Let's go back before we come into this morning's gospel. Let's go back a few verses. Led by the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus goes into the desert. There to triumph over the devil. This is after he comes up out of the waters of the Jordan, where he was baptized by John. So this gospel this morning is the very beginning of the Lord's ministry. You remember that when he heard, that he, when he heard, when he comes down out of the desert, after having triumphed over the devil, he hears that John the Baptist has been imprisoned. And it's as though this is some kind of a prophetic signal that the time is now at hand, for it's when he hears that John the Baptist was betrayed and handed over to Herod and put into prison. That's when he goes up in Galilee from Nazareth where he was living with his mother. I don't know if Joseph was still alive by now, but certainly he was living with his mother in Nazareth there in Galilee. And he goes from Nazareth, which is in the south of Galilee, up to Capernaum, which is the north of Galilee, and there by the Sea of Galilee. And here is when we read, when St. Matthew brings in the prophecy of Isaiah, and we see how the prophecy of Isaiah in this movement of the Lord going from the south to the north of Galilee is becoming incarnate. It's, it's coming to be flesh. It's, it's being fulfilled. It's no longer just a vision. It's, it's coming into reality. The true light of the world, who is Jesus, is dawning on those sitting in darkness and in the region and shadow of death, as St. Matthew says, quoting from Isaiah. The Lord, however, is not the first light of the creation, as we read about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. For that light was created. Remember, it says, the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. That light was created. That light, clearly, in my view, was the law. It was Torah. And the law, the Torah, as we read in the epistle to the Hebrews, was the divine shadow cast by the uncreated light, who, as we read in the Gospel of John, was coming into the world. And so this morning, we are reading about the Lord Jesus Christ, the true light of the world. Not obviously coming into the world, he's already come into the world, but now he's making himself manifest, he's dawning. He's, 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 he's shining on the world. It's, it's, like the, it's like the new creation that he's about to create, that he's not about to, that he is creating. It's like the new creation is now dawning. The Son of Righteousness, Christ our God, is coming up. He's going up from the south to the north. He's going up to Capernaum as the uncreated sun, rising on the world that he is now creating anew. And how does he create the world anew? He creates the world anew by clothing himself with her as with a garment, so that she might clothe herself with him. But what is this clothing as with a garment but an embrace? Is it not the Lord encircling his bride in his warm embrace so that she, as Eve, just as he had promised her in the garden of old, and find her refuge in her, in him as her Lord. He is the new Adam. He is her kinsman, as we read in the Song of Songs. Her kinsman whom her soul loves, her royal bridegroom, again as we read in the Song of Songs. So clothed in the garment of his beloved spouse, his sister, again, 
reading from the Song of Songs, and she is his sister because she's created in his image and in his likeness. So clothed in the garment of his beloved spouse, his sister, encircled by the loving arms of his mother's embrace, he, her lord, her kinsman, comes like the mighty river that we read of in Ezekiel's vision in chapter 47. He comes like the mighty river with healing in his wings, as we read in Malachi. He comes from the gate of the temple of the prophet Ezekiel's vision. But there are indications that make it very clear there in the 47th chapter of Ezekiel and earlier in other chapters before that as well that this temple that Ezekiel sees in his vision is not the temple of Jerusalem. It is clearly the true temple of which the temple of Jerusalem was the shadow. Nor is it the earthly Jerusalem that we are see, reading about in Ezekiel's vision. It is the true Zion the living temple, the most beloved, all holy, Theotokos. And you should know that. Remember what we were singing all through Pascha. Shine, shine, O new Jerusalem. The glory of the Lord has shone on you. Exult now and be glad, O Zion. Be radiant, O pure Theotokos. Like the mighty river in Ezekiel's vision, Jesus, the heavenly bridegroom, flows into the hill country, as it says in the Hebrew, Galila, Galila, translated into the Septuagint as Galilee. He flows into the hill country of Galilee, that is to the east of the temple that Ezekiel is describing. This is one indication that we're not talking about the temple of Jerusalem because Galilee is to the north. It's not to the east of Jerusalem. The destination of the Lord of this mighty river as Ezekiel foresaw is the Arabah the desert it's translated in the Septuagint as Arabia but in the Hebrew it's Arabah I suppose Arabia gets its name because it's the Arabah it's the desert and it flows into the Dead Sea that is part of this geographical system that Ezekiel is setting before us in his vision so the Lord's destination as he's coming from the temple like this mighty river, as he's coming from the temple of the gate of the Theotokos into Galilee is the Araba, the Dead Sea. Shall we say as he did in Genesis? Or shall we say as he has been doing since Genesis? when Adam and Eve heard him coming to them in the cool of the evening, he is coming to them into the garden like the north and south wind. I'm drawing again from the Song of Songs. He comes into his garden in his holy resurrection. He comes in answer to the cry of his beloved spouse, his sister, calling out to him from the depths of her heart. And this is what she's crying following again the Song of Songs. Awake, O north wind, come, O south, blow through my garden, and let my spices, what might these spices be? I think we could say that they are the bride's loving desire for her bridegroom, her beloved kinsman. Let my spices flow out. Let my desire become one with thine in that union of loving desire that surpasses all other unions. And now I'm putting the Song of Songs together with St. Maximus the Confessor. For when the Lord came into Galilee with his holy disciples, might these holy disciples of the Lord be the brethren that we read about in the Song of Songs, the bridegroom's friends, might they be the fishermen that we read about in Ezekiel's vision, chapter 47? Because there's fishermen standing on the shore of this mighty river, and they're casting their nets into the river to catch fish. 
So when the Lord comes into Galilee with his holy disciples, on the plain of the visible, well, he was coming into Galilee. He was walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee to the north. But on the plain of the invisible, in the church of the heart, he was coming into his garden. As we are given to understand, for example, again, in the Song of Solomon and throughout and in other many places throughout the prophets and the poetic books of the, old, of the Bible. For in the time of the Bible, Galilee, this hill country that was to the north of Jerusalem, because of the abundance of her rain and because of the many streams that flowed through her lush valleys down from her snow-topped mountains, which included Hermon and Carmel and Tabor, and because of the fragrance of her cedars of Lebanon, which was on the west part of Galilee, for all of these reasons and others, Galilee was loved in the Old Testament as a garden. From the encomiums of Galilee that we find in the prophets and in the poetic books of the Bible, whenever you read in the Bible about Hermon or Carmel, um, Lebanon, um, those in particular, but there are some other phrases that also have our meaning Galilee. When you when I read the, encomium, the encomiums pertaining to Galilee in the prophets and in the poetic books of the Bible, I get the clear sense that Galilee is a veiled image of Eden, even of Eve, the very self of Adam. Remember, Eve comes forth from inside of Adam. And when he sees her, he says immediately, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, woman, for she was taken from men. So Galilee is like a veiled image, not just of Eden, but even of Eve, the innermost self of Adam, in her original virginal beauty. The name Galilee itself means circle. The hill country of Galilee was so called encircled because it was encircled by hills and mountains. These hills and mountains include, as I already said, Mount Tabor, Mount Hermon, Mount Carmel, and also Lebanon, the wooded mountains that are to the west. And these mountains may be the veils that if we lift them as Holy Scripture directs, may uncover the hidden theological meaning of Galilee and of this morning's gospel. As Lebanon, Galilee in the Song of Solomon, is the land of the Lord's cherished bride. Or can we even say of her bridal chamber, her inmost heart? Because this is hidden in this wonderful word, this wonderful name, Lebanon. It's a beautiful name. The entire gospel is captured in this one word, Lebanon. Lebanon itself means whiteness, or I guess, I'm not close, and it has to do with making bricks. I don't know how whiteness is associated with making bricks, but that's one of several meanings, whiteness. But Lebanon is formed off of the word Laban, Laban, which means to wash, to purify. And there, hiding in the word Laban, is the word Lev, which is the Hebrew word for heart. Lebanon is known for her cedars, the fragrance of her cedars. And so, Lebanon is like a proclamation, a prophetic proclamation of the heart being purified, lev, being purified, being washed, lavan, by the purity, labanan, of the cedars of Christ's cross. The cross of the Lord was composed of three different woods, 
all of which may have been from Lebanon, the cedar, the cypress, and the pine. And so we read in the Song of Songs this encomium to Galilee under the name of Lebanon, this beautiful evangelical prophetic word. The bride cries, no, excuse me, the, the, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, cries out, cries out. He says, come from Lebanon, my bride. Thou shalt come from Hermon, my sister, my bride. Thou hast ravished my heart with even one of thine eyes. You wonder if this might be a reference to the eye that is the lamp of the body. My sister, the, the, the bridegroom goes on. My sister, my spouse, is a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed, a fountain of a garden and a well of water springing and gurgling from Lebanon. I hear Adam when he sees Eve for the first time. This is like what was going on in the soul of Adam. But as we understand this from, from, from the fathers, for example, as they, as they tell us how to, inter how to interpret the Song of Songs, we can also see this. This is the new Adam. This is what's going on in his soul as he sees his bride, the human soul. This is what he's crying out to her. Come from Lebanon, my bride. Thou shalt come from Hermon, my sister, my bride. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. Why else would the Lord God empty himself and take on the form of a servant and clothe himself in the garment of his beloved bride, wrap himself in her embrace so that she could wrap herself in his embrace, in his divinity. Why would he do that if he just felt so-so about her? <laughs> Clearly, he loves her. She ravishes his heart. My sister, my spouse, is a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed, a fountain of a garden, and a well of water springing and gurgling from Lebanon. So on the plane of the visible, having come into the church this morning, we have entered a building, we call it a temple, on the corner of 54th and 38th. But there's a hidden world that moves beneath this visible world. It is the church of the heart. It is not separate from the visible church. The visible church is the form of the invisible church of the heart. And the church of the heart is the real substance of the visible church. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm not making this up. I'm drawing from an ancient Christian tradition that takes us all the way back to primitive Christianity in Jerusalem. So when we come into this visible temple, we are standing in the invisible church of the heart. And in the, in the, and in the invisible, you could say we're standing in Lebanon. And in this invisible church of the heart, we are in Galilee encircled or embraced by the mountains of the true Zion, the holy Theotokos, and Golgotha. Golgotha is our temple mount, the mountain on which our temple is established. For on the hill of Golgotha is the cross, to which is affixed forever the tree of life, which was the body of Christ, which is the temple of God, the church, the pillar and ground of the truth. But more than that, as St. Augustine tells us, and I think he's drawing also, he's not making it up. He's, he, was in the, he died in 430, and I think he's drawing from ancient Christian tradition. The cross is the marriage bed on which the heavenly bridegroom became absolutely one with his bride in the tomb of her heart, that is to say, in the garden enclosed. And you remember in the Gospel of John, Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of Christ down from the cross and puts him into a new tomb that was in a garden, just a stone's throw from the cross. In the garden enclosed, the Lord Jesus becomes absolutely one with his bride. In the tomb of her heart where she was dead in her sins and trespasses, but which 
when he is laid in the tomb, having become absolutely one with her in her death. He who is the resurrection and the life, himself, he who is himself the true light, the uncreated light. What happens to the tomb? It's transfigured into the bridal chamber, or shall we say, it's restored to its original, to the beauty of its original virginity. It's restored to its true nature, its true character as the bridal chamber. And now we can refer to the heart as Lebanon, the garden enclosed of Lebanon. Meanwhile, he has transfigured Golgotha into Mount Tabor, which is in Galilee. And her heart, her lev of his bride, he has washed clean, Levan, and she has become white as snow, Lebanon, and she has become as fragrant as the cedars of Lebanon. As we read two Sundays ago, she has become a well of living water, so that there is a fountain of a garden spring, springing forth from her belly, which is translated as heart, and that's not a bad translation, but it means belly. And the sense is, in the pit of our being where we were conceived, where we began. So all the way to the core, to the sea, to the, to the pit of, where, you know, of our, where we originate, that point, that irreducible point where we originate, that point has been opened onto the beyond. And now the mighty river of God's love can flow through her, cleansing her, illumining her, making her into a fountain of, of divine love springing from Lebanon in Galilee in the garden enclosed of her heart. Here in the garden enclosed, in the church of the heart, brothers and sisters, we are children born above of God in the holy font. And here in the church, we are in Galilee because we are encircled by the warm embrace of our Holy Mother and of her Son. In the visible form, you know, how, this is a nice idea, how does it take shape? How does it take, how does it take flesh? Brothers and sisters, it takes shape. It becomes concrete. In the liturgical worship of the church, what are the rubrics all about? They're about giving shape to this divine love of God that encircles us, embraces us in the warm embrace of his love. We don't just do the rubrics of the, we're not attentive to the rubrics just because we are, you know, we're, what, we're fussy. The rubrics are the incarnation of the love of God. So when we come into the church and we begin to do the worship and we attend to the rubrics, the movements of the church, you make the sign of the cross, you venerate, you prostrate, you stand, you, you participate in the movements of the gifts, all of these things. We're giving form to this warm, loving embrace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Mother that is encircling us with the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And dear brothers and sisters, this warm embrace, it doesn't just hold us, does it? It's, it's, it's drawing us to some place. It's wanting to bring us some place. Where is it moving us to, brothers and sisters? When you were baptized, you came out of the holy font, dripping wet. You were clothed in the love of God. Did we stop there? No, you were clothed in the robe of light, as though the water wasn't light enough. 
You were anointed with holy chrism. Did we stop there? No. We did not stop until you came, until we brought you to the foot of the anvil and you received the holy body and blood of Christ, the love of God, the resurrection and the life himself. You received it as your food and drink. And now we come to rest. Now we have accomplished what it's all about. But now in the spirit, we are sent forth. Why? <laughs> to encircle the world in this love of God that we have tasted. And so we know that we have received the true faith, that we have received the heavenly spirit, that we have found the true faith. We know it, not because we've read it in the books, but because we have experienced it. We know it because we have become one with it. It's not an idea. It's become the living reality of our life. And so in the worship of the church, we're coming into this garden enclosed of Lebanon that's in Galilee, encircled by the hills and the mountains of the saints, all of them living stones that have been set in place in the living temple of God, the risen body of Christ, the cornerstone of the living temple that extends, as St. Matthew the Evangelist says, when he describes the rending of the curtain of the temple at the moment of Christ's death, that extends from the lowest depth to the highest heaven. The saints shine on us in the darkness of this world. They shine on us with the uncreated light of Christ. They have become, each one of them, an epiphany of the love of the Father for his children. And so they are, they are embodiments of all the prophets and the songs that speak of God as the Father whose steadfast love endures forever, whose mercy fills the earth, who regards his children as a father pities, who, God, who, who, guards, who, who regards those who fear him as a father pities his children, who in the Holy Spirit broods over his creation like a, like a mother hen over her chicks. They bear witness to the ineffably tender love of the mother for her son, and of the son for his mother, and of the, and of the exquisitely joyous love of the heavenly bridegroom for his bride, the church, and of the church for her, Lord, for her Lord. And this is what encircles us when we come into the church. Whether we realize it or not, it doesn't matter. Like we said a few Sundays ago, you see the whole world has gone after him and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. This is the fact of the universe. That the love of God embraces us, encircles us, and makes us into a garden enclosed, Galilee. And this reality is what's the living reality here in an Orthodox temple. So when it says that the Lord went throughout the whole of Galilee, we should understand that he has come to each one of us in that mighty river of Ezekiel's vision. That river flows with ever-increasing depth and strength from the Father into the inmost sanctuary of the living temple of the most beloved Panagia and through the holy gates of her sacred, womb, out, her sacred womb out into the world, into Galilee, into your soul, healing and making alive every creature whom those living waters touch if we give ourselves to them. They are the waters of the Holy Spirit that we receive in Holy Eucharist. They are the waters of the Holy Font. In those waters we were conceived and born of the Spirit from above as children of God. In those waters we are restored to the beauty of our original virginity. Dear brothers, is it not so? that when we give our love to the Lord Jesus in repentance, in sincerity, we stop playing games. 
and we turn to the Lord in genuine repentance. Is it not so that we can feel our soul stirring to life? We can feel his presence healing our shame and our guilt. We can feel our darkness being illumined with the light of a heavenly joy. Why then would we not long to join them from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan who followed the Savior as he went throughout Galilee teaching and healing? His teaching heals. His healing teaches wisdom. The Lord Jesus goes forth from Lebanon. He goes forth from the heart, the human heart, the tomb of the heart, now a bridal chamber, as a bridegroom in procession. In the powerful current of his mighty river, the Holy Spirit, the love of God, he would bear us up and carry us to our own land. Where? In the hill country of Galilee, the garden enclosed encircled in the embrace of the Holy Trinity, his Holy Mother, the apostles and prophets, and all the saints. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.